Well, good morning. My name is Jason Smith, and I'm the pastor here. It's been a couple weeks, but it's so glad to be back. Let me start just by thanking you for your faithful prayers for, uh, for me and for the team that just spent the last two weeks in Uganda. Uh, an incredible team, uh, Mike Kenshin and uh, John and Marie Nitt, and, uh, and God was, of course, faithful. And thank you for, uh, for being in prayer for us. Certainly, we missed you, and I missed you. I missed the opportunity to stand before you and to preach. Very grateful for Gary Cook and for David Shivers, uh, who did an outstanding job filling in uh, in my absence. Um, let me tell you, on behalf of the church, how incredible it is, right? It is absolutely amazing to go to the other side of the world and to know that we have been faithfully serving in Uganda for 24 years, okay? And, and I got to visit three different mission partners that, uh, that we've had a relationship with, and it is so awesome just to walk into uh, the legacy of 24 years, all through you, uh, all over Uganda, people know First Baptist Bernie. Oh, you're from Bernie. It's amazing to walk into uh, a prison ministry and to be able to to pass out Bibles and to be able to preach. It's amazing to stand before hundreds of pastors, our team, and to and to go through days of pastoral training. Uh, where, where the pastors are, are hungry to hear from God's word and, and to receive anything and any wisdom that we have to give. Um, it's, it's incredible to go into a blind village and, and to pass out audio Bibles, right? A little MP3 player with, with the Bible in, in Lugandan, in their language, into a blind village and to be able to teach them uh, how to use it and how to go through and to find the book of Matthew so that they can hear it and, and to just have them erupt in celebration of that. It's, it's incredible to preach. I got to preach both Sundays, uh, one in a church plant that we partnership uh, it's, it's a newer church, but they're doing incredible uh, job there in Kampala, uh, reaching uh, young professionals, leaders, uh, the next generation of leaders in Uganda. And, and we have a church that we partner with there. And I got to preach to them on one Sunday morning and then the following Sunday to go out into the rural area, uh, a church in, in a small village, Sanjay, that, uh, that our church built the church, okay? And, and, and you know, when you, when you invest in a church and you invest in a ministry and, and it's years later, um, and, then, and then I got to stand in that pulpit and to know uh, that your faithful gifts and service and partnership built this church out in rural Uganda and here I am standing and preaching in that pulpit. And it, let me tell you an incredible story. The, the service began and uh, they sang a few songs and then they, they stopped and, and we had a time of testimony. The pastor just said, does anyone have testimony? And we had uh, about three people who came down front who began to give testimony. One woman said that after praying for many years, her, her husband had come to faith in the Lord. And another one gave testimony about how, how she had gotten sick, uh, but God was, was faithful uh, to, to help her through that process. She got good medical care, and she was, she was trusting the Lord through that sickness, and she came out on the other side, and she stood up and gave testimony in that church. And, and when, when that group was done, there was, there was a lady in the back who came forward, and uh, she stood up and she said, this is my first time in this church, and, and I, I grew up in a very, uh, a very legalistic Catholic church, uh, and uh, after being here and just hearing your testimonies, I need this Jesus that you're talking about. And she got saved, she got saved right there at the very beginning of the church service, uh, before the word was preached or anything, just hearing the testimonies of what Jesus was doing. And so to, to sit in that in that context and to be able as your pastor to preach, but to know uh, that God is doing an incredible work, um, that, that there's a revival spreading all through Africa and, and to be there in Uganda. 
Um, we, uh, another quick story, we, we spent that Sunday afternoon driving uh, way out into the middle of nowhere. I mean, I mean, you want to talk about the, the end of the earth. Uh, we drove for like two hours on dirt roads and just small villages absolutely into the middle of nowhere. And, and there was a church that we met with and some leaders in that church. And uh, uh, they were just tickled to death because they some people in that village would have never seen uh, a white person before. And so they're like, what are these people doing here? And, and we came and uh, it's it's almost impossible to describe the, the difference in culture, right? Uh, the, the absolute, uh, I, 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 during my little talk, I made a reference to McDonald's and uh, as an illustration, and, and I asked them if anyone there had heard of McDonald's, not a one, no, no one had even heard of this concept. And I was like, well, this, this illustration is not going to go over very well at this moment, right? They, they've never heard of McDonald's. So, so in a situation where you could not have uh, culture or context, uh, worlds any further apart, the gospel of Jesus Christ still brings life and hope and joy and is, is, is the deepest, most satisfying thing in anyone's life. And, and just to preach the good news of Jesus, there is this bond, there's this connection, there is this, this like we are brothers and sisters. We, we could not be any further apart, and yet we are one in Christ Jesus. And so I just bring that, that, that good tidings, that, that great news, that no matter where you go, the deepest longing in any man, uh, uh, woman, child, young, old, uh, in their heart, in their soul, is the good news of Jesus Christ. So thank you for praying for us. We had an incredible trip, uh, and I'm, I'm grateful to be back, uh, but, but please know that, uh, I mean, uh, what an awesome privilege it has been, and I'm always honored to be able to come back and to stand before you to share uh, different stories about how God has moved, um, and so thank you for that. Turn with me in your Bibles to Galatians chapter 5. Galatians chapter 5, we're going to continue our walk through our sermon series this summer on the fruit of the Spirit. The fruit of the Spirit we've been looking at, let's, let's quickly wrap our minds around this idea that there is an evidence uh, that God is in us, that because we've been saved, we become the permanent uh, indwelling Holy Spirit inside of us, that he's taken out a heart of stone, inserted a heart of flesh, and that there is evidence the, the longer we walk with the Lord that his character becomes our character, okay? And the fruit of the Spirit is all one package deal. Uh, these aren't personality traits. There may be some things that your personality gravitates towards. Uh, maybe your uh, a little more patient than other people, uh, but all of these things are the fruit that the Spirit produces in us. So listen, as we begin in Galatians 5, I'm going to pick up in verse 19. Uh, I'm reading in the New American Standard. If you don't have a Bible, there's a Bible in the pew in front of you. Please take that and make it your own as a gift from us to you. Galatians 5, 19. Now the deeds of the flesh are evident which are sexual immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, outbursts of anger, disputes, dissensions, factions, envying, drunkenness, carousing, and things like these, of which I have forewarned you, just as I have forewarned you, that those who, uh, that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, Patience, kindness, goodness. This is our one for today. Faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there is no law. Now those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. Now if we live by the Spirit, let us also walk by the Spirit. Will you pray with me? Our Heavenly Father, this morning as we come to your word as we contemplate this idea of, of faithfulness, always knowing certainly that it begins with you. 
that you are faithful to us. What an incredible, just over the top statement that you would be faithful to us, that we would be able to look at our lives and simply declare, God, you are faithful. You have never failed me. Your promises are always true. As we think about that important attribute and characteristic of being honest and true and consistent and being able to press through, even even when life is filled with chaos and difficult circumstances, as we think about that, Father, we want to be like you. Uh, Certainly produce that in us, sharpen us as we we examine your word. Uh, We welcome you to convict us uh, because, Father, when you convict us, uh, you heal us and you make us better and more like you. And you certainly empower us uh, to walk out different. And so we surrender and we welcome that this morning. We pray all of that in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. How how many of you like a a good Western movie? Maybe a a John Wayne, uh, one of those throwbacks. Uh, A a good Western plot is always good for certain things that you know are always going to take place in a Western uh, one is, is there, there are two things surrounding the fight scene of any good Western. Uh, two things you can count on. One, uh, that is that the build up to that fight scene is going to involve some of the slowest, most drawn out moments uh, that you could possibly imagine, right? When two people stand off face to face, the the, that movie is going to make that about five minutes. You're going to watch one bead of sweat just slowly go down and just this, just this look and then this look that goes back and forth, all of that. And then that's immediately going to be followed by the fastest fight scene that you ever imagined, right? One guy pulls out a gun and then everyone falls over and that's it, right? The guy goes, and then everyone falls, right? So you can count on the slowest buildup, the fastest fight scene ever. Another thing you can count on is there's going to be uh, usually a, a surgery scene of removing a bullet, Uh, Usually that surgery scene is performed by a vet, someone who's completely unqualified to do that. They're like, I'm used to working on horses, but I guess I can do this. And and there's never any medication. Like they give them a handkerchief and they say, just bite on this. I'm going to dig in there. I got to get this bullet out. Those three things. And then the fourth thing that you can always count on in a Western is a faithful lawman. Okay like the Wyatt Earp type, someone, someone who, who is a lawman that tried to go back to normal lifestyle, but, but those bandits come back into town, and even though he wants to not respond, he has to, right? Because his character is faithful, he has to do what is right, and he will rise up. He cannot only think of himself, he must respond. You like that, do you? All right. The fruit of the Spirit Evidence of God's abiding presence that the Holy Spirit is inside of you is faithfulness, that the Spirit will produce in us a faithfulness. Let's define it first. Faithfulness is having character of being trustworthy, dependable, honest, a person of integrity, someone who keeps their word. So first thing is having the character. And second thing is having that character proven over time. Always through difficult circumstances, right? Because you you only know that that character is there when it's tested. And so you're going to go through difficult circumstances so that your character can be proved that you are dependable and reliable, that you have faithfulness. If we think about faithfulness in the place of the fruit of the Spirit, you see that it's it's kind of the, the quality of displaying the other fruits of the Spirit consistently over time. So let's begin with honesty. Let's ask ourselves the probing question, right? Are your words true? Are they accurate? Are they reliable? Would your family say so? Would your business partner say that your words 
are straight and can be trusted. When you forget something on a project at work, right? You drop the ball, you forgot it. And your boss asks you about, about it. Do you simply say, you know what, boss? I, I messed up, I forgot. Or do you go into a series of excuses and distractions? Have character. People make mistakes and your boss will appreciate all right, you owning up to it. Not to mention that in the long run, your reputation will be on the line. Now, who do you think of whenever you think of someone sleazy, underhanded, and dishonest? All right, let, let's leave all the politicians aside. So put that out of your mind. Uh, let's, let's, let's go to a stereotypical used car salesman. All right, now, if you happen to sell cars here, I'm sorry, I'm not trying to take shots at you. I just want us to think about that stereotypical slick back hair. You know, I don't trust anyone with a full head of hair. <laughs> you know, just that, that guy, he's got all that hair coming out of his shirt. All right. Did you know that 83% of Americans hate the car buying experience? They hate it. One in three, catch this, one in three said that they would rather do their taxes. They would rather go to the DMV or they would rather sit in the middle seat of an airplane for the duration of the trip rather than haggle with the sales department, uh, sa the sales of, of getting a new car. All right, Americans hate buying cars. Why? Because that salesman, like he, he flatters and he exaggerates, he tells you all the reasons you must buy this car. And the whole while you're thinking, I know you're getting a commission off this, right? It's so obvious. I can't trust a word you're saying. And I'm thinking right around the corner, there's going to be a quick sleight of hand on all of this stuff. I don't trust you. There's, there's underlying motives in all of this. Proverbs 12, 22, the Lord detests lying lips, but he delights in men who are truthful. The prophet Daniel is a perfect example of biblical faithfulness. Over the course of 70 years in Babylon, three different kings found him faithful, that he was dependable, that he was a man who said things straight. He would give an honest answer to a situation. There were times where he would say, I don't know. When other servants of the king would flatter, they would give very favorable interpretations to dreams so that, oh, the king will like me if I tell him all these good things. Daniel, he knew. Daniel, he'll tell me. He'll tell me what the Lord says. He will give the truth, come what may. A faithful Christian like Daniel is dependable. You will find him or her doing what they should be doing when no one is watching. Do you remember those who hated Daniel and they, they seemingly caught him in a trap? Do you remember what Daniel was doing? He was praying in his room like he always did, even though a law had been placed by the king, you cannot pray to anyone. There was Daniel in difficult circumstances, rain or shine. There he was being faithful to the Lord, could be found praying. The faithful Christian also doesn't mind accountability. In fact, he even welcomes it whenever it's appropriate because he has nothing to hide. His motives are pure. When Paul was traveling around, you can read about this in 2 Corinthians, Paul's traveling around doing a collection from the, the churches that he had planted on his missionary journeys. He was doing a collection for the church back in Jerusalem because they had gone through an extreme famine. <clears throat> and Paul thought about uh, just what an incredible picture of the gospel and the unity of the gospel that it was for the Gentiles to be supporting the Jews back in Jerusalem. And so he's going around and he's taking this offering that we in uh, theology call the, the Jerusalem offering. Now, did you know when he would go and collect 
money that churches had set aside, he insisted that a church send a representative with the money. The whole way back. Now he could have pulled rank as an apostle and said, look, I'm an apostle, all right? God's using me to write portions and that you can trust me, okay? In fact, it would have been a lot cheaper, had it not? But instead, especially when dealing with finances, because he knew the importance of being above board, of being transparent. This is honesty. This is faithfulness. Additionally, the faithful Christian is willing to pay the price for character, not simply when it's convenient. I've told you guys before uh, that during college, I went on a mission trip to India for three months. While I was there, we did a mission project uh, where I spent two weeks with, uh, with this uh, pastor in, in his ministry. We were doing work for him. Um, and in the, the two weeks that I met this pastor, pastor's name was Paul. Um, uh, that guy had an impact on me that I still remember to this day. Just knew him for two weeks because he carried the impressions of Christ. Now, now the first thing that he did that, that struck me that I just remember was uh, as soon as we got there, uh, he prayed over us. And with a tenderness and a care, he prayed over our team and he said, he said these words, I know that these conditions, that they're not used to them. Father, would you, would you give them strength and the ability to endure some hard times that they're not necessarily used to or prepared for? That just struck me. I was like, wow, what a shepherd. When I think of the word faithful, I think of, of this guy, Pastor Paul. Um, I learned of a story while I was there that Pastor Paul in India is very customary in a, in a lot of, of services that uh, in order to get your electricity turned on, you had to give the technician a bribe. So there, there, were, there were normal prices and all those things, but the technician would come out and, and he would demand, he would look around, all right, you're living like this, I'm gonna demand a certain amount of money. And Pastor Paul refused to pay the bribe. He said, it's, it's unbiblical. I'm, I'm not going to pay the bribe. He went three years without electricity in his home and in his church, all there in the same compound. He went three years and instead simply prayed that God would fight on his behalf. And after three years, because of his character and reputation, like they just turned on his electricity. Now, you think about this. Right? Faithfulness, having the character to pay the price even when it is not convenient. The unfaithful is the opposite of the dependable. They are flippant with their standards. I'll keep that commitment if it's convenient at the time. If the winds of circumstance change, then so does this person. You see, when they gave their word, it was in their best interest to keep it. And they had full intention at that time until, well, a better, more convenient proposition comes along. My dad taught me at a young age to keep my word. If I started an activity like a sport, I had to finish the entire season. There was no quitting in the middle because I'd given my word and the team depended upon it. Now, there were many times where I hated this rule. Okay, and one of those was when I, I would, I would wrestle, all right? I wrestled growing up. You guys know what that is? You wear those really tight things and you get around and, and wrestling. And uh, the thing I hated most about, about wrestling growing up was uh, I get motion sickness really easy. And for some reason, they thought a really good exercise uh, I guess it makes you a really good wrestler, is, is if you can do somersaults across the entire length of the gym, there and back. And I'd throw up at the end of this. This is the worst practices. I still remember it to this day. I'm like, what does this have to do with wrestling? Uh, but you had to do that. And I was, like, I was like, Dad, as soon as this season is over, I am done. I'm out of here. I also remember uh, we used to have to, there were weight classes, and we used to have to 
pull weight. And so there I am as like a a 10 year old kid sitting in a hot car with the heater on, uh, chewing gum and spitting into, uh, into a cup while I'm, I'm, covered in sweat clothes, right? Because you got to get the water weight out of you so that you can make weight. Well, it didn't take long for me to realize as soon as this season is over, I'm done, dad, that's it. But I couldn't quit in the middle of it. And everything inside of me wanted to. You see, the enemy of faithfulness is, is to be filled with excuses. The list of reasons that you give in the midst of a difficult situation for why you're going to compromise. The sluggard in the book of Proverbs is unfaithful. He's lazy, full of excuses. He says, there's a lion in the street. I can't go to work. You say, no, there is not. Oh, yes, there is. There's a lion in the street. That's one of my favorite Bible verses, by the way. It's Proverbs 26, 13. The sluggard says there's a lion in the street. There's nothing worse than being dependent on a sluggard because you're counting on him and yet he's full of excuses. If I'm honest though, if you're honest, sometimes I lie to myself, particularly when I see someone else's faithfulness. I remember when I finished reading George Mueller's autobiography, I closed it and I said, you know what? I'd probably be just like him if I grew up in those times and lived under those circumstances. And you do it too, right? You see someone who faithfully gives to the church and you're like, it must be nice having all that money, being able to faithfully give like that. Proverbs 26, many a man claims to have unfailing love, but a faithful man who can find I'm embarrassed to tell you that I didn't always keep my word. There was a particular time uh, whenever I was a, a high school senior where I didn't have the character to keep my own word. I, uh, I switched prom dates. Yeah, I, I'd, I'd invited a young lady and Then, well, a better proposition came along, and then I had to make that awkward phone call to a young lady who had already bought a dress and follow up and tell her, yeah, I'm I'm not going to be going to prom with you. I know, you can boo and hiss all of that, right? (laughs) It's terrible. It's awful. And you look back, and you're like, it is so painfully obvious the only person I was considering was myself. No concern for this young lady. Now, could you imagine if God was like that? If God was not faithful? If he were like the Greek gods who's fickle and petty? He's like, I don't want to listen to their prayers today. Gosh, all they do is grovel. God, save me out of this. God, could you help me now? Could you imagine if God was like us? I mean, praise God, he's not. Praise God that the Bible says that he is a rock. That in Jesus Christ, right, on this solid rock I stand, because all other ground is sinking sand, that God is faithful. He can be trusted. He is trustworthy, dependable. He will keep his promises. Did he not keep his promise to Abraham that he would have a son in his old age? I mean, even after Abraham really tried to monkey up the whole thing, was God faithful? Did he not keep his promise to David that he would one day be king? And Luke 2, did he not keep his promise to Simeon that he would see the birth of the Messiah before he died? And has he not been faithful to you? We were in Uganda, and and I I told you we did prison ministry. And and so one day we had planned to go to the prison, and and I was supposed to give a a 30, 45-minute sermon, and then Mike Kinchin was supposed to follow with like a 30-minute devotional. Um, And he was was had really worked on it hard and was looking forward to it. Well, we get there that day and we're super late. And when we get to the prison, they're like, hey, you got 15 minutes. 
uh, and then, and then we, we got to shut it down. And so, uh, you know, both of us had, had prepared all this. And, and so we walk in and we, we have time to do basic introductions. And then, and, and then I just do like, like a stand-up 10-minute uh, quick sermonette sort of thing. And then we had to leave. Um, and, uh, uh, you know, if, if we're honest, uh, we're both disappointed. And, and Mike particularly, because he, he had worked hard to, to prepare this and this devotional. And, and he was going to get... He was going to share a tender part of, of his story, um, of his testimony about how, uh, how he had had uh, a breakdown with his own father growing up, but, but how God had used that and God had become his father. And he really thought that would connect with the prisoners. And so as we were leaving, though, we, we had given out some audio Bibles and, and, and we told them that we, we had some paper Bibles. And so we, we had promised them that we would come back the next morning and, uh, and give them those Bibles. And so as soon as we left, I, I just began to, to pray. God, would you, would you open up a door? I, I know Mike had worked for, for months preparing this, this devotional and really wanted to give it to these prisoners. And so the next day we show up and we're just supposed to be there like, like three minutes, right? We're supposed to drop off uh, Bibles and, uh, and, and those audio Bibles on MP3s. And, and so as we did that, they, they were like, yeah, one of you can come inside and just, just like set the stuff down. And so like, I pretended like I didn't hear any of that. And so Mike was going in because he knows how it all works. And I just, I just got right behind them and went in too, right? So what are they gonna say? And they didn't stop us. And so then we got in and, and uh, while we're in there just, just talking, they found out I was a pastor and they were like, hey, do you, do you wanna go talk to the prisoners? I was like, absolutely, he does. He's prepared a whole message. Why don't you open it up in there? And so, so we go in that day and, and wouldn't you know it, the the group that had gathered was like twice the size of the day before. And, and Mike got to stand there and he got to, he got to give his, his testimony, all that he had prepared, and he got to present the gospel. And seven prisoners came to faith in Jesus Christ right there. And, and so you look back and, and you say, God is faithful. God is faithful. Isn't he? Hasn't he always been faithful to you? Would, would you give testimony that God is faithful? He's always been faithful to me. He's never turned away from his promises towards me. Even when I am unworthy, and I am so often found unworthy, he's always provided for my every need. I can look back at every trial in my life. I can look back and I can honestly say, he has used it for my good. He is so faithful to me. Never once have I regretted going into a situation and trusting him 100%. Never once have I said, you know what? God failed me in that situation. Think of the audacity of what I'm saying. Who am I that the King of Kings and Lord of Lords would be mindful of me? Who are we that God should be faithful to us? We struggle with faithfulness. We struggle and yet God has promises towards us and keeps them and pursues us. And you read in his word that he has had these promises towards you from eternity past. He has known you from the foundation of the world, that he has been wooing you, he has been calling you, he has been unfolding all of history. The, the coming of his son, the sending of his spirit, particular times in your life when you, when you awoke to hear his voice, when you could just see his faithfulness. Who am I and who are we that God should be faithful to us? And yet he is. He is. You say, why is he? I don't know. All I know to do is to praise God 
for the grace that's found in Christ Jesus. To thank him. I mean, I cannot answer it. When Peter denied Jesus, God was still faithful to him. When David had, killed Ur had Uriah killed, God was still faithful to him. When I am at my absolute worst, God is still faithful to me. In Jesus' name, he declares me that I am forever his own. Are you in Christ? You are forever his own. Oh my gosh. That he is for you to shape you and to guide you, to correct you, to love you, that he delights in you as a father does a child, that he is faithful towards you. Psalm 36, five, your loving kindness, O Lord, extends to the heaven. Your faithfulness reaches to the skies. And as you and I drink that in, doesn't it make you want to be like him? I want to be faithful like him. The fruit of the Spirit is faithfulness. The final aspect that I want us to consider this morning as we work through faithfulness is this. That someone who is found faithful is one who steps into the responsibility given and is a good steward of all that God has done. All that God has given. That says, I have been bought with a price. I am not my own. That's what it means to be found faithful. Someone who steps into the responsibility and is a good steward. In Matthew 25, Jesus tells a parable about a master who goes away on a long journey. And when he does so, he, he brings and he lines up his servants and he gives them different talents. Now, a talent is a very large sum of money, like 20 years worth of, of a day laborers, okay, is one talent, okay? It's a huge sum of money. And in the parable, uh, to some he gives five, to some he gives two, and to some he gives one. And then he leaves on a long journey. In Matthew 25, it says, at once the good servants felt the important responsibility of their assignment, and they immediately went to work. But there was one servant who was unwilling. Unwilling to work, unwilling to take risks, and merely dug a hole and buried the talent. Now, after a long time, the master came back, and he wanted to see his servants, and he wanted to find out what had been accomplished while he was gone. The first one, who had five talents, had doubled it and made five more. And he presents these to the master. Matthew 25, 21. The master said to him, well done, good and faithful servant. You were faithful with a few things, and I will put you in charge of many things. Enter into the joy of your master. Don't you long to hear those words? Well done, good and faithful servant. What does it mean here? It means to step into the responsibility of all that has been granted and tasked with you to take it, to do something with it, and to present it back to the Lord. That person is found faithful. Church, listen to me. We get to participate in the kingdom of God. Guys, we get to. We get to be the hands and feet of Jesus. We have the good news. We get to be the hands and feet of Jesus at our work, uh, in our neighborhood, with our friends. We get to, to go on mission trips 
and to gather our money collectively together and to go to the ends of the earth. We get to have partnerships with people on the other side of the world for 24 years. We get to be led by the Holy Spirit and simultaneously dream and, and pray and, and use all of our faculty, our mind, our resources, our wit to use all of that for the kingdom of God and to create things. And to, and to witness to people and to see like 12 young people come to faith in Jesus Christ. I mean, can you imagine those, those 30 uh, uh, chaperones, adults that went, that, that are a part of, of all of that? And at the end of it, to stand before the Lord and to say this is what you have entrusted to me. This is what I was able to participate with you and to hear him say, well done, good and faithful servant. Like we, we get to. But there was one who took that talent, that money, and, and buried it and said, man, the, the master is hard. He, I'm not gonna take risks for him. I'm not gonna work for him. I'm not gonna get anything out of this. I'm just gonna have to give the money to him, right? When, when you consider the, the unfaithful servant, the one who did not take the opportunities, did not step up and take responsibility and work hard. It was just lazy and full of excuses. You ultimately realize he, he does not love the master. He's so far from the master. This morning, as we close and consider faithfulness as a characteristic that the Holy Spirit produces in us, my heart longs to hear those words. Doesn't yours? I mean, one day really soon, you're gonna stand before him. Don't you long to hear, well done good and faithful servant. Let us not be slack. If the Spirit has, has pressed an issue in your life this morning, right? Your use of time, your giving, your word, whether it's, whether it's honesty, like is there faithfulness in your life and are you stepping into and taking responsibility of, of opportunities that the Lord is placing before you to be his hands and his feet, to be a worker in his kingdom so that when it's all done, he would say of me that I was faithful. Wow. That I was faithful. Will you pray with me? King Jesus, why you are faithful to us and why you are pursuing us and why you are so good, we cannot explain. But we thank you. And we do declare that you are faithful. When we are ever unworthy, you are faithful. And we want to be like you. We want to walk like you. We want to be found faithful ourselves. And we know we're a work in progress. And so we, we welcome your spirit right now to convict us that we, would, that we would lay down areas in our life that, that you find unfaithfulness. And spirit, we confess we are dependent upon you 
that you would produce in us what only you can. But we welcome that and we long for it. And even still, we would say that it was done in your faithfulness, God. We pray all of that in Jesus' name, amen.